If you have your Bibles this morning, come together once again to the book of Psalms and Psalm 18. Psalm 18. You remember that David had been in an extremely difficult situation. We've been going over this each week and we've seen how that while he was serving in King Saul's court, he is surrounded by men. Uh, men who are speaking against him. They're telling lies about him. They're uh, talking to King Saul and spreading untrue rumors about David and, and how that he is not to be trusted and all of that. And, and as a result of that, David's life now is filled with danger. His life is filled with trouble. And, and, and so we saw in our study a couple of weeks ago how that it was during that time of trial, during that time of testing, uh, that David was basically driven to his knees in prayer. Uh, nowhere else to look. And so, and so he turns to the Lord. He's looking to the Lord in prayer. And so we saw the prayer of David in Psalm 17. And you remember there were two main points that we saw in that psalm. The first one was, uh, Lord, hear me. That was, that was the first request. Lord, hear me. Uh, God, I need you to hear what I'm saying. I, I, I'm in trouble down here, and I, I need you. I need you, Lord, hear me. And, and then he also said, Lord, hide me, hide me, uh, protect me. And, and, of course, you remember we saw that the Lord God graciously heard David's prayer. He graciously answered David's prayer. And, and because of that answer to prayer, David did exactly what he should have done. He gave thanks to God. He gave thanks to God for the answer. Uh, I'm afraid that many times, as far as Christians are concerned, I, I cannot think of a single sin. I cannot think of a single sin in the life of a Christian that is more prevalent than the sin of ingratitude. The sin of ingratitude. We have been, we've been saved uh, from the eternal hell that we deserve. Uh, we've been made to become a child of God. We have, we have been given the wonderful promise of a heavenly inheritance that will never fade away. We, we have been given a purpose that makes our life worth living. And, and yet we who have received so many things from the hand of our God are so many times nothing more than spiritual ingrates we don't give thanks we don't give thanks but but not so with the man after god's own heart as soon as his prayer had been answered david immediately begins to give thanks to god and we noted how that the importance of giving thanks is very clearly seen when we consider the amount of time that david spent giving thanks to god for, for the prayer that had been answered. You remember we saw in, in chapter 17, we saw David's prayer was only 15 verses long. It's only 15 verses long. But David's praise that we're seeing here in this chapter, David's praise is 50 verses. Uh, 50 verses of praise are, are given. And, and so we began our study through this prayer of praise uh, last time. We saw, first of all, we saw David's deliverance, you remember. We saw David's deliverance. And we saw that because of that deliverance, David declared four things. He declared, first of all, his love for God. He declared his faith in God. He declared his determination toward God that he's going to be a man of prayer. And then also his confidence from God that God is a God who hears and who answers prayer. And so there's the result of David's deliverance. Those four things came about as a result of that deliverance. But, but then he goes back and he reviews the circumstances that had brought him to that place of prayer. And he talked about his dangerous troubles. He, he talked about his earnest cry. It's, it started out with a call. And then it progressed to a cry. Because the answer did not come immediately. God delayed in giving the answer. And yet not only was there his earnest cry, there was his confident faith. Even though God delayed in the answer, David was convinced that God is a God who will answer prayer. He's a God who hears our prayer. And then he talked about his amazing rescue. How the Lord God fought for him and his victorious end. How that his enemies are defeated 
and he is victorious. And then we saw the cause of it. The cause of David's deliverance was simply because the Lord God delighted in him. The Lord God delighted in him. By the way, the Lord God delighted in David because David delighted in the Lord God. Don't, don't think you can make God second place in your life and God will delight in you. Don't, don't think that. He has to be number one. And so, and so da the Lord delighted in David because David delighted in the Lord. And then we talked about David's character, number two. We talked about his character. We saw how that David's delight in the Lord God was seen in two ways. First of all, by his obedience and then by his diligence. Well, now we're going to continue in this chapter. We're going to take up from that point. And I want us to notice number three now, David's assurance. David's assurance. As we speak of this, please understand that we're talking about David's assurance in the faithfulness of God. That, that's where his assurance is resting. His assurance is not resting in himself or in his own abilities, but it's resting in the Lord God. And, and so we find two things here. First of all, uh, David speaks of God's faithful justice of his faithful justice uh, notice the beginning in verse number 25 the bible says with the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful with an upright man thou wilt show thyself upright with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure and with the froward that is those who pervert god's will thou wilt show thyself Forward. In other words, the man who perverts God's will, God is going to pervert his will. Do, do you see a kind of a picture there of the New Testament principle that whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap? That's exactly what we find shown to us here. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 states it in very clear terms. Be not deceived. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Uh, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that's what he's going to reap. And so David understood that the Lord God is, he's absolutely just. He's absolutely perfectly just in all of his dealings with men. He is perfectly just in all of his dealings. And so therefore David says in verse number 27, For thou wilt save the afflicted people. That is, those, those humble people who are suffering unjustly, uh, those who are suffering wrong, even though they're trying to do everything that is right. Uh, thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down the high looks. In other words, God's going to humble those proud, arrogant ones who are always looking down on others. He's going to bring down the high looks and so david speaks first of all of god's faithful justice he also speaks of god's faithful mercy of god's faithful mercy even believers we've said this before many times in our sermons uh, you have experienced this many times in your own personal lives and in your walk with the lord uh, even believers go through times of trouble. Everybody agree with that? Sure. Even believers go through times of difficulty. Uh, even believers face trials of darkness and difficulties and, and, and all of that. And, and yet even in the darkest days of our lives, we are never without the light of comfort. And we're never without the light of peace that God is able to give. And that's exactly what David says. Notice it in verse number 28. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. And so the faithfulness of God, seen in his justice and seen in his mercy. Well, that brings us to number four that we find in this chapter. And we find David's testimony. Once again, David is going to reflect on God's mercies. He's going to reflect on God's mercies. Charles Spurgeon in his commentary on the Psalms, I think he said it very well. When he referred to these verses that we're going to look at now, he referred to them as the ripe fruit 
of a thankful spirit. They are, these are the, this is the ripe fruit of a thankful spirit. And, and so notice several things that David is going to speak about as he gives his testimony. First of all, he gives his testimony of how the Lord God delivered. Of how the Lord God delivered. In verse number 29, David said this. He said, for by thee have I run through a troop. Now let me stop right there just a minute. You understand what David is saying there? Have you ever have you ever heard of someone running a gauntlet? You understand what that term means, running a gauntlet? That 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 was something that that where they would sometimes to punish a soldier who had brought shame to his company by disobeying an order. All of the soldiers of that company would line up and they would line up in two rows facing each other and they would be equipped with, with whips or sticks or whatever and, and, the, and the guilty party would have to run through that line and as he's running through everybody's just beating on him okay and, and that's called running the gauntlet that's exactly what David is talking about right here he says I have run I have run through a troop I've gone through and they are beating me black and blue I'm, I'm getting beat all up here as, as I run through this troop and and, and, and by me uh, or by my God though notice what he says even though I've run through the gauntlet by my God have I leaped over a wall in other words by God's grace he's able to escape it he's able to escape it God delivered him even though it seemed like there was no escape and even though it seemed that that gauntlet would never end, yet there came a time when it did end. One of my mother-in-law's favorite sayings is that it came to pass. It did not come to stay. And, and, and when we're facing troubles, that's, we can take hope in that. We can take hope in that, how the Lord God delivered. Not only did he give a testimony of how the Lord God delivered, he also gave a testimony of who the Lord God is of who the Lord God is. Verse 30 and verse number 31. As for God, His way is perfect. You know what? If we could just get that one thought firmly planted in our mind, that God's way is always perfect, that would sure deliver us from a whole lot of stress. It, it would deliver us from a whole lot of worry. It, it would deliver us from a whole lot of fears and frustrations. Just the confidence that, you know what, I don't understand it. But His way is perfect. His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is tried. It's been tested. It's been proven to be true. And He is a buckler. That simply means He's a shield. He's a shield to all those that trust in Him. For who is God save the Lord and who is a rock? Save our God. Because of the greatness of the Lord God. Because He is the true and the living God. We find that David once again now not only turns his attention to who God is, but he turns his attention, let her see, to what the Lord God said. In verse number 30, and uh, verse number, I'm sorry, what the Lord God did. And, and two times in the following verses, we find that the Lord God girded David with strength. During his time of trouble, during his time of trouble, God increased his strength. When I was in high school, I saw, uh, I saw some pictures uh, of, this, uh, of this guy called uh, Mr. America. And, and uh, boy, he had muscles bulging everywhere. And, and, of course, the ad was, you want to look like this. You know, well, who, who doesn't, right? And so, and so uh, I told my folks... I'd like some, I'd like some, for Christmas, uh, I'd like some barbells and dumbbells. Uh, dumbbells are the ones who pick up the barbells, okay? But I told my dad, I, I, I like some barbells and dumbbells. And so, and so they, they, for Christmas that year, I got a 110 pound set of barbells and dumbbells. And, and so when, when, I, when I saw the box, you, you know what I did? I, I took it and I, and I pushed it into the closet and I said, when I get strong enough, I'll start picking them up. That's not how it works, is it? No, you don't wait till you're strong to pick up the weights. You pick up the weights so you get strong, right? 
And that's exactly what God does sometimes. God allows us to, to, to have difficulties in our lives. And, 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 and he, he works in our lives through the difficulties in order that He might strengthen us. In fact, that's what David says. Look at it. It perfected Him. It gave Him stability. It perfected Him. Uh, verse number 32 says, It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. It's God who does that through the trials, the difficulties that I'm facing. God is giving me strength. He, he's perfecting me. And He's perfecting me in several ways. First of all, He gives me stability. And in, in verse number 33, He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. Watching a National Geographic show one time about these mountain goats. Uh, David refers to them as hinds. And, and, and how that they are on these rocky cliffs and, and how they just kind of bounce around up there. And, and, and they're just as sure-footed. They, they never slip. And, and they just bounce all over those places. And, and David said, that's what God does for me. Just like, just like hinds feet. He sets me up in the high places. He gives, me, he gives me a stability. Not only was there stability, God gave him wisdom through the difficulties that came. God perfected him with wisdom. Look at it in verse number 34. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. In other words, David is able to overcome even the superior weapons, the superior knowledge of his enemies. He's, over to, he's able to overcome all of that just as he had faced Goliath and overcame that great enemy. He's able to do it because God. God gave him wisdom. God gave him wisdom. God gave him stability, gave him wisdom. God also perfected him by giving him protection. Look at it in verse 35. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand holdeth me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Wow, what a wonderful thing. The protection of the Lord God for David. And then the Lord God also perfected him by giving him authority. Notice he says in verse number 36, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me. In other words, David now is able to go places, move further than anyone thought he would ever be able to go. His steps have been enlarged. His feet do not slip. And all of this came to David, not because of his own scheming, not because of his own planning, but rather it was given to him by the Lord God who strengthened him. The Lord God who perfected him. And not only did it perfect him, not only did it protect him and, and perfect him, but it also, it did protect him. It protected him. David once again declares his testimony of victory in verse 37 and verse 38. He says, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. I, I think of this story of David when he was facing Goliath, you remember, and he won that great victory. And, and then they start pursuing the armies of Israel following David. Now they're pursuing the Philistines, you remember. And, and they just kept going and kept going and kept going until the battle was totally won. That's the idea that David is presenting here. What a wonderful truth it is. And the reason he's able to do all of this, again, verse number 39, for thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. It's God who gave him the strength. It's God who gave him the ability. Now here's the point. Since the Lord God had given David the strength that he needed for the battle, since the Lord God gave him the strength that was needed for the battle, question, who won the victory? David or God? God did, right? It, it, it was God who did it. David's just the instrument God used. But the victory came from God. The victory came from God. And, and therefore, in reality, all of the credit, all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the praise for the great victory that has been won, who should it be given to? 
should be given to God, right? But what did the women do? What did the women do when David returned from the battle with Goliath, you remember? They said, David, or Saul has slain his thousands. David, ten thousands. Technically, that was not true. It was God who gave the victory. They should have been giving the glory to God, not to David. They should have been giving the glory to God. But God gave that great victory, and therefore the credit, the glory, the praise, the honor, it all belongs to the Lord God. David understood that. David understood it. That's why he says in verse number 39, Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. And once again, David declares the greatness of the victory that the Lord God had given to him in verse 40 and verse number 41. Thou hast given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them. Even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Let me just mention a very important truth that we need to remember here. And that is this. When those wicked, ungodly men began to fight against David... And, and, and then God begins to intervene in that situation. And those wicked, ungodly men who have risen up against David, when they begin to fall because of God's judgments on them, I want you to notice that there was no one who could help them. There was no one who could deliver them. In fact, even the Lord God Himself would not help them. The Lord God Himself would not come to their aid. Charles Spurgeon said it well. He said this, God never suckers His foes at the expense of His friends. In other words, God will never throw you over to your enemy. He, he will never bless your enemy while judging and, and bringing problems to you. You see, to fight against God's man is to fight against God. So don't expect Him to defend you when you're fighting against the man that God has raised up. That's the lesson that David has learned. That's the lesson we find illustrated in his life. And so because there was no one to help them, no man and no one in heaven who would help them, David said in verse number 42, Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind, I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. And so because the Lord God's strength had been perfected in him, and because the Lord God's strength had protected him, I want you to notice what he says in verse 43 and verse number 45. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people. Thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. David's victory. Notice number five. David's praise. David's praise. As we come to the final verses of this chapter of prayer, which is an offering of praise and thanksgiving to God, David is basically going to just kind of go back and he's going to give a quick review. He's going to go back and review just a couple of points. First of all, we find once again his acknowledging. His acknowledging. In verse 46 and following, the Bible says, The Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivered me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. All through, David is acknowledging once again, the victory is not in his own strength. The victory is not in his own power. 
The victory has come from God. It's God who did all of this. It's God who delivered him, protected him during his time of difficulty. And so there's this acknowledging of what God has done for him. But then there's also a review of his thanksgiving. A review of his thanksgiving in verse number 49 and and verse number 50. He ends the psalm with these words, Therefore, therefore, because of all that God has done, because the way God has protected and helped me and and delivered me from, from those who would seek my destruction, therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David, and to his seed forevermore. As we look back over our lives, all of us have experienced so many of God's mercies. Uh, We've experienced so many of God's blessings. And that's why the biblical admonition is given in the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse number 34. The admonition is this, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For He is good, and for His mercy endureth forever. Give thanks unto the Lord. Why? Because He's good. And because His mercy never ends. His mercy never ends. And yet how sad it is that so many times, as I mentioned earlier, we selfishly take God's blessings, all of the things God so freely and graciously gives to us. We take God's blessings, and then we come back to God, and what do we do? Uh, By the way, God, I I have some more things here I want you to do. I have some more things here I want you to give me. And, and, and so we come back and, 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 we're, and we're always asking and asking and asking and asking. God, give me, give me, give me. Do this, do this, do this, and do this. But we never come back and simply say, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you've done. I want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for the way that you're working in my life. And, and Lord, what a wonderful comfort it is to know that even though I don't understand everything that you're allowing in my life, I do know one thing. I do know that you are good. And I know that your mercy will never end. And I can thank you for that. I can thank you for that. To give expressions of thanks and our appreciation for all of the things that God has already done for us in the past the things that he has given us in the past. I I, I hope this morning that we will determine that we're going to be like David. We're going to be like David. You You look at the majority of our prayer time, and like David, it ought to be focused on giving thanks to God. If, if, If you pray for any certain amount of time, the large percentage of that prayer time ought to be thanksgiving. It was for David. It was for David. We ought to be a thankful. We ought to be a thankful people who are focused on praising our God, thanking our God, worshiping our God for who He is and for all of the wonderful things that He has done for us. Prayer of praise. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for David's example. What a wonderful example it is for us to follow. Lord, how, how, how sad it is that so many times we take your blessings and we never stop to give thanks for it. Lord, I pray that you would forgive each one of us for the ingratitude that we show toward you so many times. Lord, help us to always be grateful. To be grateful not only to you for the blessings that you bring into our lives, but help us to be thankful for those people that you use to bring blessing and help and an encouragement into our lives. Uh, Lord, help us not to take you for granted. and Help us to not take one another for granted. But help us to truly be a people who have a heart that is filled with thanksgiving for who you are and for all that you've done. 
Dismiss us now with your blessings. Blessing the hour that is to follow.